This evening we're going to be looking at a portion of Psalm 119, a psalm which um, I'm sure many of you know by now is uh, written to basically extol God's law. Uh, the person or the psalmist who writes it uh, highly values the law of God for a variety of reasons. And uh, I do recall um, in, in uh, days past when I was in a different theological tradition that basically saw the law of God as something that has been done away with and um, something that we should uh, not desire or um, keep. I used to read this and wonder how it is that, that someone who loved the Lord could love the law to the degree that they did. <laughs> and of course, now understanding that it is something that the Lord uh, desires for us to do, it makes perfect sense. And we certainly need to see it in that sense. This is the heart of a redeemed individual who loves the Lord and loves the law because it shows him how he might honor him and glorify him and, of course, shows many of the reasons why he ought to do this, uh, not the least of which, of course, because he loves the Lord and wants to honor him and because in doing so he is, well, loving God and his neighbor. But there's many other reasons given in this psalm as well, and that's what I would like for us at least to look at partially as we consider the first eight verses of Psalm 119. So let me read that for you as we begin. The psalmist writes, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies, who seek Him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in His ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening, and may He encourage us through the things that we see in this text to desire to keep His commandments even more carefully, even more closely than we have uh, in the past. Now, as you know, we just finished a um, uh, kind of a partial segment within a series uh, why we believe what we believe and why we believe that uh, we should keep the commandments and what it is that the commandments are all about. Uh, we did consider that one of the main reasons why we ought to do it is because the moral law of God is the perfect expression of love. And that is certainly what the Lord wants us to do, to love Him with all that we have to love Him with and I should say most of all, we're going to see something about that this evening, and also our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, we looked before that as to why we believe that God still intends for us to keep it. And let me just remind you briefly that as we consider the commandments, I hope you see that there's really nothing that we could change about them. Uh, there, there's really no way to conceive that it would ever be right to break these things. I mean, when is it ever right to have some other God besides the true God? or to worship Him in the way you would want to rather than the way He wants, or to break your oaths and vows, or not to worship Him and spend time with Him as He calls us to, or again to break those commandments which we know is loving and respectful toward our neighbor which does nothing but good to them. It can never be right to break those. Uh, we saw that Paul says for that reason the law is holy, the law is righteous, the law is good. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount that heaven and earth will pass away before anything in the law could possibly fail. And as we're going to see shortly in the book of Hebrews, the blessing of the new covenant is that God actually puts these in our mind and He writes them on our hearts. To think that these could be done away with is inconceivable, but the whole of Scripture is against that idea. Instead, the whole of the new covenant is to teach us or at least is to give us the power to do what is right. And what is right is what is loving toward God and toward our neighbor. And of course, as I mentioned in my prayer, this is exactly how Jesus Christ lived. And it's the example that He gave us to follow. 
I mean, really, can you look at his life and see anything in it that could be interpreted in any other way than love? Even when Jesus was pronouncing judgments against, um, well, against those he did, he did so only because of his love for the Father, because the Father is vindicated when those who hate him are judged. I mean, in loving God, it uh, doesn't always mean that, uh, well, that the neighbor is necessarily going to benefit from it, uh, especially if he is one who hates the Lord. And actually, we could even construe the Lord's denouncements of judgments against the Pharisees as a means to turn them away from their sins and to begin to do what is right and to honor God and to honor their neighbors so that they would, um, well, that they would do what is safe and good and pleasing to the Lord. We do need to understand the commandments tell us what love is, and when we break those commandments, we are hating God, and we are hating our neighbor, and that's why God judges us so severely. That's why it brings guilt. That's why hell exists, because of this hatred. Well, again, that's what we've already seen, but I thought it would be helpful for us, having understood those things, to look at some of the motives that the Lord gives us, besides the things we've already seen, uh, to keep the law. Psalm 119 actually gives to us many motives, all of which can be very helpful. We need motives because we are creatures of purpose. We are creatures of motivation. We are moved by our hearts to do what we do, and our hearts need to be moved by motives. That's what motives are. They move you. And we need to have our affections moved in a good and right way in order to do what is right. We have the Spirit of God working within us to move us in that direction, but He uses truth in order to do that. So let's consider a very important motive in our passage this evening, and that is that if you keep the commandments, there is great reward. If you keep the commandments, God will bless you. And I think whether we um, understand it or not, all of us really do want God's blessing. We want to be happy, and this is the way that we can be happy. So we're going to look at three things this evening. We're going to look, first of all, at what it, what it means. What is it that the uh, author is saying here with regard to walking in the law of God? Because it's, it's really not as simple as it may appear at the, you know, on the surface. Secondly, what God promises you if you will live by this standard, at least in this portion of the text. And then thirdly, what you should do because of this promise. So first of all, what does it mean to walk in the law of God. Well, certainly at this time in the psalmist's mind, it meant to him keeping the whole law of God, the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law because God had commanded Israel to keep all of it. And the psalmist could actually look at all of that and say, it is good, it is, it is beautiful, it is something that I desire. Now, we have things a little bit more you know, simply for us today in the sense that there have been changes since the days of the psalmist. As we saw this morning, for instance, the ceremonial law has changed with the changing of the priesthood. Jesus could not be our priest if the ceremonial law still stood because He is not of the tribe of Levi, He is the tribe of Judah. God changed the law, instituted Christ, Christ fulfilled, He basically did it by fulfilling uh, the entire ceremonial law through His work, so we no longer need to keep it. And we should be thankful because Peter says at the Jerusalem council that it was a burden which neither they nor their fathers could bear. So why should we place that yoke on the neck of the Gentiles? Well, we're Gentiles. We don't need to bear that yoke because the Lord has fulfilled it and in doing so has opened heaven for us. Uh, the civil law was the law of Israel that was meant to govern them as a state. Now, those laws passed away when the state of Israel passed away. And the fact that there is a nation of Israel right now uh, doesn't really matter because it's not the same situation they were living in then. Now, we understand that since most of those laws were simply applications of the moral law, and applications, we would say, of true and godly justice, the general equity of those laws remains today. 
We're not going to get into that, but it is something we should also see as incorporated in this and something we should love. We should love godly justice, equity. Uh, we should love certainly true morality. But we'll set that aside for now and focus on how this applies to the moral law because for all intents and purposes, that's the most important thing to us as believers. We're not the state, we're not magistrates, we're not governors. So uh, the idea of justice is not something that we'll be applying, although it is something we would like to see. But we're going to consider the moral law, the Ten Commandments, since these remain. What does it mean to walk in this law? Well, simply it means, uh, most simply, that when it comes to what it is that you're going to do or not do, this is the standard that you will use to determine whether you will or not. This is the standard that you will live by. Now, that's quite simple. But the author here fills it out a little bit by making several parallel statements. One of the things about Hebrew that you probably noticed in the Old Testament, there's a great deal of repetition. The repetition is what we call parallelism in Hebrew. What it means is that the author uh, says the same thing in a variety of ways to give you a fuller picture. Sometimes in the Psalms, very often in the Psalms, uh, he'll make one statement and then he'll intensify it in the next statement and we can certainly see that happening here. To reinforce what he's saying, particularly in verses 1 through 3, what does it mean to walk according to the moral law? Well, it means in verse 2, to observe His testimonies, to take note of what God is saying and making sure that we do it. It means also in verse 2, to seek Him with all your heart. Again, these are all parallel statements meant to fill out for us what it means to walk in the law of God. To seek Him with all your heart, to walk in the law of God means to live with this kind of intensity to seek Him with all that is within you, not just part of you, to not have a divided heart, a heart that is divided between Him and yourself as far as whom you're going to, you know, pleasure as it were, between Him and the world, it's going to be Him, between Him and any person or anything, we will serve Him and Him alone. And of course, when we're talking about serving the Lord and seeking Him with all of our heart, we mean more than just going through the motions, more than just being formally right, but having, as it were, like our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, a zeal that consumes us for the glory of God. As He saw the, um, what they had done to the house of God, the temple of God, and how they had made it a, a den of thieves, our Lord Jesus Christ was consumed for zeal for His Father's glory. Uh, when the disciples brought him food as he was speaking to the woman at the well of Samaria after she had left to go get the rest of the men of the city uh, to tell them the Messiah was here, he says, I have food to eat that you don't know of. My food is to do the Father's will and to accomplish His work. Uh, that's the kind of intensity the author to the, he or this, not the author of the Hebrews, I'm to you saying that, but the psalmist is saying in this psalm. It means in verse 1 to be blameless, uh, to seek to live a life that is beyond reproach, where no one can point out anything in your life and accuse you, or I should say make it stick as it were, anything that you're doing that's wrong, even as our Lord Jesus Christ said on one occasion, which one of you can convict me or convince me of, of sin? Uh, Jesus had done nothing wrong. It's not that people can't accuse you, but they can't rightly accuse you. This is one of the things that really stands out about the Puritans. You know, we call this, this kind of movement a pietism. And the one thing that ties together at least all those uh, Christian writers that, that we can appreciate, even if we don't agree with all their theology, is when they had a desire to live a godly life. And that's exactly what the Puritans were like. And of course, as they sought to live this way, as you might imagine, they were accused of being overly scrupulous. And here's one example that J.I. Packer gives in a collection of, of essays, actually, that were called the Puritan Papers. Uh, I guess uh, it was Lloyd-Jones who I think helped organize this annual meeting 
where they would bring papers, people would present papers on the Puritans and they put them together in a collection of books called the Puritan Papers. But this is one that J.I. Packer had given a quote from one of those papers. He says this, Richard Rogers, the Puritan pastor of Wethersfield, Essex, at the turn of the 16th century was riding one day with a local lord of the manor who after twitting him for some time about his precision ways, asked him what it was that made him so precise. Oh, sir, replied Rogers, I serve a precise God. If there were such a thing as a Puritan crest, this would be its proper motto, a precise God, a God that is who has made precise disclosure of his mind and will in Scripture and who expects from his servants a corresponding preciseness of belief and behavior. It was this view of God that created and controlled the historic Puritan outlook. The Bible itself led them to it. And we who share the Puritan estimate of Holy Scripture cannot excuse ourselves if we fail to show a diligence and conscientiousness equal to theirs in ordering our going according to God's written word. So this is basically what it means to live by the moral law. It means to seek to honor God with your whole heart, to seek to live a perfect life, as perfect as you possibly can, a blameless life, one that you know God will be pleased with because this is what He has revealed as His will. Now, even if that's not humanly possible, that's what you will seek to do. It's not really possible because of our sin, that is, to live, to live a perfect life. Only Jesus could. But of course, as we seek to live it and understand how difficult that is, it also reminds us how thankful we are for God's mercy in giving us His Son, who actually did live perfectly according to this law and gives that righteousness to us as a free gift if we will simply trust Him. So that's what it means to walk according to the law of God. Well, secondly... What does God promise if you will do this, if you will live by His standard in the way that we just talked about? Well, in a word, God promises blessing. Again, look at verses 1 and 2. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies, who seek Him with all their heart. Now, we might look at this blessing as, as in, in a variety of ways, but maybe we could divide it into these two. That if you obey the Lord, you are blessed. If you obey the Lord, you will be blessed. First of all, if you obey, you are blessed. That is, if you are obeying in the way that the psalmist describes, observing his testimonies, seeking him with all your heart, you're blessed already because you couldn't do this apart from God's blessing, the blessing of a changed heart, the blessing of having the Spirit of God working within you. You're already blessed beyond measure because you belong to Him. This is the evidence of the new birth, of adoption into His family, that you bear the image of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian, and that's why the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch is because when the people looked at them, they saw they were living like Jesus Christ. And it's important that you bear the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you live like Him. Otherwise, you really can't know that you belong to Him. Remember what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That is, not everybody who claims to be a believer will actually finally enter into heaven. And why is that? Well, because not everybody who claims to be a Christian actually is a Christian. How do you know who the Christian is? Jesus says, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
The practice of sin, John tells us very plainly in his first letter, means nothing more than that we are of the devil. To practice righteousness means that we are born of God. And when you see yourself seeking the Lord in this way with all your heart, seeking to live a blameless life according to the commandments because you love Him and you want to honor Him, that is the evidence that you are the Lord's. And so you have the blessing of assurance. Assurance is a great blessing, especially to those who have a very tender conscience. And that's really the second point. You're blessed, secondly, because you can live with a clear conscience when you keep the commandments. The psalmist says in verse 6, or actually verses 5 and 6, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon your commandments. You know, if you have a tender conscience, you can understand that, that this is a great blessing because those who do... Uh, well, basically have uh, that sense of guilt that is always with them, that they have, you know, am I the Lord's or am I not? I've, I've done things against Him that I know are dishonoring to Him, and are my sins forgiven? Well, if you see this going on in your life, this desire to love and serve the Lord, and if, of course, it comes from trusting in Jesus Christ alone, then you can know that your sins are forgiven, as we sang this morning. You know, arise, my soul, arise, shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. How can you know that He appears on your behalf? How can you know the guilt of your sins is removed? Well, the evidence is, of course, the kind of life you're living because it tells you that you really are trusting in the Lord. The only way we can know is, is by what we experience, really. We look to Jesus Christ and how can I know that I have believed in Him? Well, the book of 1 John reminds us, if I keep His commandments, that's one very prominent thing, and I practice righteousness. So if you're obeying the commandments in this way, you are already blessed. You have assurance and you have a clear conscience. But if you obey these commandments, you also will be blessed. You'll be blessed first with spiritual power. Because in obeying the Lord, you will not, of course, be grieving and quenching the Spirit of God who is seeking to lead you in that direction. You'll have more of His power because you won't be offending the Spirit of God. You won't be weakening His work, pouring water on the fire of that love which He is seeking to kindle in you. And because you won't be weakening that work and He won't be withdrawing because of this as it were, grief and quenching work, you will experience more and more of His power. He will give you greater strength. And of course, if you want to serve the Lord, that is a very important blessing. The Lord will also be with you, He says, secondly, in, in helping you, uh, basically, in the things you attempt to do for His glory. Uh, God is with those who love Him and who are walking with Him and who will submit to Him. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31, He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, He increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. God will give you strength in the things you attempt for Him. He will also grant to you blessing and success. And I think primarily in the spiritual realm, but I believe also the Lord will take care of you physically as well. As a matter of fact, Jesus says as much in Matthew 6, 31 through 33, where He says, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What does Jesus have in mind here by seeking His kingdom and righteousness, except to seek to give Him glory and honor, being a true believer, seeking to do His will, to submit to Him, to seek Him with all your heart and to do His will 
as you put Him first, He will take care of your needs. He has promised that He would. Uh, one thing we we're talking about uh, today at lunch is the fact that when you were seeking the Lord in this way, seeking to be His first and foremost and to honor Him, He also promises that He will hear and answer your prayers. How important is it that your prayers be answered? Do you want God to hear you? You know that sin is what causes Him sometimes to turn a deaf ear to us, even though He knows precisely what we're saying. Our sins separate us from Him. But when we do what is honoring to Him, the Lord hears. James 5, verses 16 through 18, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. The fact is the Lord does distinguish the, the fact that, well, the idea that if a righteous man seeks him, he will hear that man rather than one who isn't really taking obedience to him seriously. And you can know as you serve, of course, the Lord with greater power and are more useful to Him because you are seeking to submit to Him that you will have a greater reward in heaven because all these things you do for Him are storing up treasures in heaven where you will be able to keep them forever. So when you walk in obedience with all your heart, you gain the blessings of assurance. You gain the blessing of a clear conscience. You gain greater spiritual strength greater help from the Lord, greater care from the Lord of your needs, greater answers to prayer, and greater reward in heaven. Do you want those things? Okay, this, this is the path. This is the way that you get these things by trusting in the Lord and then seeking to obey Him. And that brings us to our third point. What should you do in light of what we've seen? Well, first of all, the psalmist would counsel you to keep his commandments in verses 4 and 8. He says, you have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. And in verse 8, I shall keep your statutes. Why did God give you these commandments in the first place? Well, he gave them to you so that you might keep them, so that you would know what honors him, so that you might be able to love your neighbor and help your neighbor, that you might find blessing, uh, the blessing that we've already seen, as well as having the blessing of a firm foundation upon which to build your life. You see, this needs to be, as it were, the operating system of your life. This needs to be the structure. This needs to be the foundation. Uh, Jesus says at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, which is nothing more than just simply applying the moral law of God. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Do you want to have a strong foundation for your life? Keep the commandments. That's why God gave them to you, is so that you might have a foundation that would stand against all the difficulties that you will have to face in life. Well, second, in light of this, he says you should not only keep them, but you should keep them diligently. If keeping the commandments is honoring the God that you love, if it helps your neighbor, if it provides a firm foundation for your life and grants to you blessings now and blessings in the future, then you should keep them as diligently as you possibly can. As we saw earlier, you can't be too precise in your obedience to God's law. Unless, of course, you go beyond it, but that's hard to do because it requires perfection. But I do want to give you one warning because, um, you know, sometimes things of this nature, as, we, as they begin to take hold of our hearts, 
And we see the value of these things, the value of obedience and, and how it honors the Lord and how that's really His will for our lives and how God loves these things. And we begin to, uh, well, begin to move that direction. It can cause you to begin to look down on your brothers and sisters if they're not following suit, if they're, you know, doing something other than what they ought to be doing. But if in your obedience to the Lord and you're seeking to be scrupulous and precise in, in a good sense, to be blameless and to seek God with all your heart, if in your pursuit of those things you begin to despise your brothers and sisters because they're not living up to the standard that you believe they ought to be striving after, then you're already failing because the Lord says the second greatest commandment, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord didn't give you these commandments and give you the command to seek to be blameless so that you could become a Pharisee and look down on other people. But He did this to make you like His Son, who, being absolutely perfect, saw all the flaws, not only in everyone around Him, but in His disciples, and didn't criticize them to the ground because of it or despise them or seek to separate Himself from them, but rather got down, as it were, humbled himself and became a servant to them to help them see and to help them do what it is the Lord has called them to do. So what we ought to do, of course, is seek to keep these things diligently and to become as much like Jesus as possible. But in doing that, let's not forget he wants us to be servants to one another. He wants us to help one another become more like this as well. Thirdly, the psalmist says we should pray that the Lord would help you do this. The psalmist cries out in verse 5, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. You know, realizing the blessings that obedience brings, he cries out to God for help because he knows he can't do it on his own, and neither can you or me. We need the Lord's help, and God stands ready to help, which is why we should pray and ask for his help. But finally, we need to be thankful when the Lord answers our prayers for help by giving us greater power and particularly by giving us more of His truth. In verse 7, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. So what the psalmist is telling us here is we need to try to learn what pleases the Lord. We need to study the Word of God we need to meditate on it. We need to pray that God would reveal it. And as He shows us more of what He actually requires of us, put that into practice and do it as diligently as we possibly can and know that as we do, God will bless us. So if you want the blessing of God, this is the way you get it. It is through obedience. Obedience as closely as you possibly can to become like the Lord Jesus Christ in every way possible, in your thinking, in your desires, in your actions. The more you become like the Son of God, the more your life will be pleasing to God and the more He will bless you. That's actually His purpose, remember. We were predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son so that Jesus Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren who are like Him. That's the reason why the Lord saves us, is that we might become more like Him. And this is the standard that He gives us, that shows us how. So may the Lord give us the grace then to keep His commandments and to do His will and to have this kind of intensity in our walk with Him. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do this.